Let us not forget everything that happens. It's by the will of Allah. Holy it's time to unite and stand, and we will be the best amongst men. It's not time to be extreme or duty unthinkable, but to stand together as one. Turn into sooner followers, streaming. Every day, various platforms, trust me, you'll find a way, soon the followers. Assalamu alaikum, you class alert. Join us every Saturday and Sunday at 9 p.m. Central for the Articles of Belief by Muhammad S. Adli, right here on Soon the Followers. Email Hamdulillah, Wasalat, Wasalam Allah, Wa Rasulullah. Welcome to our last class for today, which is the 24th day of Ramadan. And inshallah, I hope everyone has been continuing on with doing the good deeds that are pleasing to Allah in hopes of reaping the reward of the night of Qadr, the night of decree. This is the one night of the year that Allah shares his knowledge as to what he's going to do for, from, this, from this moment until the next Ramadan. He shares that knowledge with the angels. And on that night, Having that knowledge, the angels all descend, all the archangels, including Jabril, Michael, uh, the twins, uh, um, uh, they all descend. Marut, Harut, those are the twins. They all descend upon the earth and they walk the earth making dua for the believers because they know what's going to happen to us. They know who's going to be born. They know who's going to die. They know who's going to be hit with an earthquake. They know who's going to get a tornado. They know who's going to have war declared on them. So they have that knowledge that Allah has shared with them. And so they are walking the earth looking for Muslims, believing Muslims who are gathered together, remembering Allah, praising Allah, glorifying Allah, calling upon Allah for change in their life, calling upon Allah for help and accepting his decree. And these angels will surround you. They'll make do it for you. They'll ask Allah to forgive you. That's the night of decree. And I hope each and every one of you are taking the time to make dua, asking Allah to forgive you of your sins. Today, I shared with you how to put more kick to your supplication. You don't have to do those things. But as the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us, doing these things will put more kick to your supplications. I hope you sisters will find a spot alone in your bedroom tonight before Fajr during the last third of the night and just sit on the bed, you know, call upon Allah using his beautiful names. And then praise Allah and then send blessings upon the Prophet Muhammad and then face the direction of the Qibla and raise your hands and cup them together and ask Allah for whatever it is that you need, whatever it is that you want, whatever you need or want for this upcoming year, make dua asking Allah for it and ask three times, repeat your request three times, knowing that Allah is true, that Allah speaks the truth and that it will happen because he's promised he'll answer your dua as long as you are not disobeying him. What does that mean? 
That means you sisters cannot go back after Ramadan to, to not wearing hijab. I got my Moroccan sisters here that's living in France. Oh, I heard about what goes on in France. Y'all have to take off your abaya. You have to take off your hijab whenever you go into a government place and look like Kafir women. Uh-uh, uh-uh-uh. You should have moved. Why are you still living there? Why are y'all choosing to hang on to that lifestyle? Okay? Now, there's some people that can't move. For those women that are unable to move and they're forced to do what they have to do, it's different. But a lot of you sisters ain't forced. You choose to stay in, in uh, France. Okay? If you are deliberately disobeying a law, he's not going to accept any of your deeds and you can forget about him answering your supplications. Y'all understand that? You've heard of the Ramadan Muslims. Who are the Ramadan Muslims? The Ramadan Muslims are the ones that join Sunnah followers every year during the month of Ramadan. And they, they, they go by the book trying to practice the deen. But as soon as Ramadan ends, they stop coming to my classes. They stop practicing the deen. They stop trying to go back to their evil ways. These people can forget about getting any uh, answers to supplications. They can forget about getting forgiveness of sins or anything else. Because as we talked about yesterday, as we talked about yesterday, as we talked about yesterday, Part of forgiveness means you have to have the determination to never go back to that sin again. So if you're thinking of going back to disobeying a law, you can forget it. You didn't fast. A law is not accepting your fast or anything else. You just starved yourself. You just put on a show for 30 days. And don't think that the angels will not throw it back in your face when they pull your soul at death. Oh, I have to scare you right now. The truth, the truth is a painful pill to swallow. When the angel of death comes to each and every one to take our soul, they're going to throw it back in our face. They're going to say, why didn't you move to another part of this world where you could practice your deen? Why didn't you relocate like other Muslims in France did to another part of the world where you could practice? Was not a lost earth spacious? Did not Sister Layla tell you that? You were there in Layla Nasheba's classes. She taught you Islam in its truthfulness. You chose to listen to her for one month and then you left and went back to your old ways. Or you refuse to listen to her because you couldn't control, you know, the jealousy in your heart or whatever. Whatever the reason is, the angel, when they pull your soul at death, they will throw everything back in your face, people. You can't fool a law. You can't lie to him. It's already written. It's already been recorded. When an angel of death pulls your soul from your body, Atib and Rakib, the angels over your shoulders will be present and they will throw it back in your face. You knew the truth. You chose to reject it. Your fasts were not accepted. Allah is not going to accept uh, uh, your, your answers. And they will tell you as they carry your soul up to be written in the book of paradise or hell, they will tell you, you will know that you're going to hell. Oh yes, don't get it twisted. When your soul has been pulled from your throat, they will let you know that you're gonna end up in hell. You will be in that hell fire until the day of judgment. They'll tell you, those angels will be with you, the angels of your shoulder, and they'll be saying, yeah, she chose to disobey a law, and when they get up to where they're going, they will declare that your name be written in the book of those who will do time in hell. And you know what they're going to do then? This sister knew the truth. This sister abandoned it. They're going to drop you. Oh, yeah. They're going to drop you. 
Your, you will, your soul, you will be dropped back down into your grave. And when you are dropped back in that grave, that's when Allah will cause you to hear the last thing from this world, which is the people of your grave walking away. And guess what? It's time to pay up with the hellfire. Hello, it's a scary thing. If we think about death and what's gonna happen at death, that'll make you sisters keep wearing those hijabs. That'll make you sisters do your prayers every day. That'll make you sisters continue to come to my classes even after Ramadan. Because those angels, the writers, they're gonna throw all this back up in your face. And you don't know, this might be the year that you die. It could be tomorrow. It could be next week. This may be it for you. So that's why the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us never, ever, ever forget the destroyer of the pleasure of life. And what is the destroyer of the pleasure of life? Death. A lot of my students have been sharing how they've been thinking about death a lot. This is a good thing. That means your fitra has been awakened because the believer never stops thinking about death. The prophet Muhammad always thought about death. Aisha, Um Salama, Hani, Kaula, all the companions, they always thought about death because that's what keeps us from straying away. That's what makes us obey Allah. So for those of you who think about death a lot, that's a good sign. Just make sure it's balanced. You don't want to think about death to the point where you lose hope. Balance it out. I think about death at least, I would say at least 10 times a day, maybe more. I think about death 10, at least 10 times a day, but that's what keeps me from doing bad things. That's what makes me stay in my house. That's what makes me sit here on the internet and give my dower and not be like these other women <clears throat> being paid thousands of dollars. Oh yeah, they don't, they don't do it for free. Y'all think those women that's famous is traveling for free? They get the least amount they get is two thousand. The least amount those women charge is two thousand dollars. Plus, you have to pay all their accommodations too. Oh yeah, them women are rich. What keeps me from being like them, making two thousand dollars in one day? By just going to one one lecture here, another two thousand there. Five, I can make five thousand dollars in one day just going to different mosques talking. What keeps me from doing that? I think about death, so I stay right here in El Bait, my bait, my house, in my bedroom, and I do my dawa online for free. Free of charge. My payment, inshallah, will come when my soul is pulled. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. I did post up the pages. We're talking about the articles of belief. In order to be a Muslim, you have to believe in the resurrection. You have to believe everything that the prophet Muhammad told us about death. What I just talked to you about, this is what the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said happens at death. When your soul has been pulled from your body, you have to believe everything I just said. Because everything I just said is what Allah said. To question it, <clears throat> to deny it, to not accept it means your belief system is null and void. That means none of your fast or good deeds are accepted. Everybody got it? So today we're gonna speak more about that day of judgment. Let me put the PowerPoint up on the screen. 
And I got a person here asking me the question, is it haram to live in a non-Muslim country? No, the earth belongs to Allah. The earth does not belong to man. You can live anywhere on this earth as long as you can practice your religion. The prophet Muhammad's companions lived in Abyssinia. Abyssinia was not a Muslim country. Abyssinia was just like America, a Christian country, but they were able to practice their religion. But if you are living anywhere, be it a non-Muslim country or a Muslim country, and you are not able to practice your religion, that's when migration becomes an obligation. As Allah says, my earth is spacious. Here's your Dalil. <clears throat> my earth is spacious and you can live anywhere on it as long as you're able to practice. For those women living in France, you are not able to practice. You cannot wear hijab. You cannot wear a baya. Those are part of your religion. Those are obligations. So you have to move. France is not allowing you to practice your religion. Just like the Quraysh of Mecca, the Meccans did not allow the Muslims to practice their religion. That's why the Prophet Muhammad left Mecca and migrated to Medina. So if you are allowed to practice, that's different. You can live in America. America, you can wear hijab, you can walk around naked here. They don't care. America don't care if you walk around naked, okay? But in France, you can't practice your deen. So get out of it. For those who are able, move, or you will be held accountable by law. And by the way, there are some so-called Muslim countries that won't allow you to practice either. If you're living in a so-called Muslim country and you're not able to practice your religion, get out of it too. Move. If they're imposing laws and conditions on you that are oppressive, telling you that you got to cover your face, that you can't be beautiful, move. Allah is going to say to you, was not my earth spacious? Everybody got it. Let's not get it twisted. Real dawah, real talk, plain grassroot English. All right. So let's put the PowerPoint up on the screen. We're going to talk more about judgment day. <laughs> You know, we have to balance our hope. Remember Islam, you know, we have to balance our fear. We have to balance our hope and our love for Allah. Today, I gave you guys hope. My first class was all about hope, being hopeful of Allah's forgiveness. But now I don't want you guys to be so hopeful that Allah is going to forgive you of your sins that you start not wearing hijab and stuff. Uh-uh. I'm getting ready to balance that with fear. Fear balances out the hope. Hope balances out the fear. So we're going to talk about judgment day. Okay? Mr. Salina, by the way, in France, there's uh, some certain area only not having the hijab, but it is not, it's not uh, uh, for the sister have freedom to wear hijab or not. Even, even the club in, 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 in uh, France. Yeah, I'm going to put to give you the camera. Hold on, I'm putting the camera on. No, it's okay, it's okay. But yeah, okay. yeah, because remember, I got some sisters here. A Y and them used to live in France. She made my, she lived, they moved. Yeah, we know some places, but the government. As, as she was, as AY was saying, she just moved away from there. They don't allow you to go into any government office with a heat jab on or a niqab. They can't wear them to school. They can't wear them to no government office. That's why a lot of the Muslims left, like AY. But you got some Muslim women that stay in there. A lot of these Moroccan sisters I'm talking to, they know who they are. We got these Moroccan sisters right here listening. They could go back home to Morocco, but they don't want to. They want to be French. They don't even speak the Arabic. It's all about say la vie. 
You gonna answer to a law you know, for that? They know, you know who they are. You know, actually, in uh, France, they occupied uh, uh, Algeria, Tunisia, yeah. and Morocco. I know that yeah. was the first language in that time. But now, Alhamdulillah, the three countries they speak now. They forcing the Arabic language. Yeah, that's why I'm saying. The, yeah, these yeah. sisters can, and they need to go back to Morocco. It's all about the no, say no, 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 no. Believe me. Sister, with all my respect, there is a freedom in France, some certain area, yes, but still they are able to have the hijab and the niqab even. Well, not where these sisters are living. They're not in their area. Some certain area, some certain area inside the government only the government system. Yeah. Well, not the theirs. Government, not the France. Not the France. Still they have freedom. And why? Because the majority of the Muslim uh, is a Muslim number in Christianity and Muslim over there. Most likely from Algeria, from Tunisia, from Morocco, from South, South Africa. And they are Muslims. Yeah, they're here in my they're website. Gonna, but where they these. Prevent the, gover the government they cannot prevent that period illegally. You know, the whole country uh, economically uh, could destroy it. They are afraid. Well, they prevented it, but Awa, are you in here? Sister Awa, what was you saying? They can't wear it. Say it again, Awa. Awa. Uh, they can wear um, hijab at school. They can't. Uh, yeah. The jilbab. Uh, yeah, she, she said they can't the wear them. They can't wear those either. Yeah, that's, why, can, that's what these sisters are saying. Too. They said we cannot wear hijab or jilbab. And they said the same but, thing. Yeah, in school. The, skirt, the big skirt, they ban everything now. Yeah, they but said it's banned. But Sister Salayla says very important thing, Sister Salayla. They, they, they live there. They live there, Jamali. I understand. But, uh, but some certain, some school allow. Not but where they Salayla are. You have to move. You have to move. Right. Haram. Rasulullah 13 years in Mecca, yeah. and himself, he left his house, and the Sahaba, the companion, male and female, they left their houses in Mecca, mm -hmm. and their Medina. Yeah, that's right. yeah, that's what I tell, that's what I'm telling them. They have to move. Where they live at, they can't do that. They said they can't wear hijab, they can't wear jilbab in any of their government offices, nor any of their schools. So what do they do? They said they take them off. So that's why I'm telling them, well, why don't you move? The earth is spacious. It's not lawful to live there. That's Islam. The prophet left Mecca for that reason. And so they said, well, we like it here. Well, you like it here. You like this world better than the hereafter. You have to move. I, Go to Germany. My advice, my advice sister, do not die and without hijab. Even if they force you, hijab is your honor, your dignity. Your beauty, that is your deed, is that hijab. You know, unfortunately, a lot of Muslims, they got, they got left it, left it. But still, the four was different, alhamdulillah. Yeah, that's what they saying. They, ju they just like living there. But that's why I'm letting them know you. it's not lawful. you got to leave. Uh, I, I don't like, I don't, sir, I went to France. I don't like it at all. My son, actually, he went to France a few times, and friends. I don't like France. My mother's people are from France, and my <laughs> my mothers they don't like it France. either. Nice in France, Nice in France, it's very good. The, the, the rocks over there, the minerals, are very good. Mm -hmm. My mother's and family people, don't like people, it either. People is nice too, but yeah. only in Paris is very bad. People. That's what my mother said. That's what my mother's family says, too. It's bad over. France is pretty bad from what I'm hearing. And they say it's not the big deal that people make it out to be. It's so much that goes on there that's bad. The government, it's just bad. <laughs> but these sisters, I mean, you like it. But, you know, this world, you're going to have to make that choice. Do you prefer the life of this world over the hereafter? You know? Yeah, but, uh, 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 if you're Moroccan. لو انت مغربية مغربية لازم تسبيك أربك وتهار الجامعة المغرب المسجد اللي أنا فيه هذا مغاربة ديس مسجد أيام ده إمام هير قال ما يعني 50% 50 مية مروكا مغاربة تعال على هنا أنا وسهلا وركب وركب تو أمريكا إذا we have a freedom here الحمد لله الحمد لله yeah yeah, she said that they're saying that some of their family did leave, but they just like to stay there. They just like it there, you know, but a lot of their family yeah. did leave. 
Yeah, they like it because perfume over there is good. <laughs> and do you know why perfume is a good sister? Why? Do you know why the ladies over there have the best perfume in France? Do you know why? Why? You don't know that? No, no. Well, I, I like the per, I like per, uh, Parisian okay. perfume too, yes, but why? Because the Fr the French ladies they don't need to to hit to take a shower. Oh, I read that because in history. Yeah. So think, so think, so think, and they cannot take shower. The perfume, perfume, just for change her identity. And they don't <laughs> like to shave too. I know. Yeah, that's history. Exactly, yeah. Exactly. That's yeah. so think. Mm -hmm. I don't. I, I heard about this, you know, I heard, I think my son, that was my son, he was the best, he's a friend, French. I say women, they hate to take shower. And shave. That's why perfume is number one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, by the way, guys, you know, if the French are the Viking, that's that Viking blood in me. That 35% Viking blood I have, I'm from the Giton. Y'all see that spat, that statue of that man in, in Paris? That's my great-great-grandfather, Jean Giton. The the Senate of King Charlemagne, Viking that put Protestant. Yeah, that's my people's. But hold on, it's a Viking, a lot of Viking Muslims. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm talking a about the I'm just Vikings. talking about the history of France. That's that yes, black, they yes. they're Vikings. That's why they don't like taking showers and stuff. Vikings used to sew their clothes on them. Yeah. But they're they're uh, outside are beautiful and handsome ladies and men. Yeah. But unfortunately, just men them. Oh my Rabbi. Yeah. Or of war, or of the Lord. Salam, Dr. Jamali. Mashallah. Yeah, I'm glad Dr. Jamali came in and shared that too, sisters. Yeah, but yeah, you can live anywhere on this earth as long as you're able to practice your deen. If you live in some place like you sisters are saying, y'all live at, where's that bag note or whatever that is, and you guys are not allowed to, um, you know, wear the hijab and abaya, just move. I mean, you can move somewhere else. Go to Germany or some other. If, like Dr. Jamali said, if there is a part of France, which I heard the y'all are saying there isn't, that allows that, move there. But don't stay where you are, you know? Because it's going to be thrown back in our faces on the day of judgment. Allah is going to ask you that when your soul is pulled, was not my earth spacious? Think about it. You some good sisters. Continue to come to my classes even after Ramadan. And inshallah, I bet you want to move then. <laughs> yeah, mashallah. May Allah bless y'all. Okay, let me put the PowerPoint up because tonight I'm going to balance it out. We're going to talk about that day of judgment. Let me put this up on the screen for everyone. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, I don't care for France either. My mother's people, the Vikings are from there. Yeah. Yeah, that statue of Jean Guiton, my great-great-grandfather. Looks like my brother. Red hair, funny-looking nose and everything. Yeah. <laughs> All right, hold on. Let me put the PowerPoint up on the screen. Hold on, everybody. I'm going to start with the Zoom people so you can see. Here we go. Uh oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. PowerPoint. The PowerPoint got tripped up here. Here it is. Okay, here we go. I'm getting ready to upload it. <laughs> the sister, <laughs> she said uh, she likes my classes so much. Yeah, she said, inshallah, we will continue to come. I hope so, because I want you sisters to grow in your knowledge and your understanding of the dean, man. Once your faith increases, you'll find it easy to do. You know, and this is a reality, guys. Once the, our belief in Allah increases, it's all about aqidah, aqidah, aqidah. Once your belief in Allah increases, sisters, you'll find it easy to do the things that Allah commands you to do. So just keep coming. I'm telling you, your Iman will continue to grow because I'm going to work on trying to awaken that fitra within you. Okay, so tonight, this is the book, The Articles of Belief. This is the book written by Sheikh Muhammad Saeed Atli. 
We'll be covering pages 58 through 60. Make sure you guys go to Atlee online to purchase this book. I meant to put the address over there and I forgot. Okay. But this is the page. These are the pages. And we're going to be speaking about judgment day. Listen to what Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning. And again, you'll be getting the reward of pondering the Quran during this sacred month with this verse. Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning, they who have believed and done good deeds, they are the best of creation. Their reward with the law will be gardens of perpetual residence beneath which rivers flow, where they will live forever. And Allah will be pleased with them and they with him. And this is for those who fear their Lord. Y'all see that? Whatever sacrifices we make for the sake of Allah, this raises our position, our status in regard to him. And we become closer to earning his love. And remember guys, Allah has promised that he will never allow the hellfire to touch anyone whom he loves. That's what it's about. Why do we obey Allah? Why do I wear hijab? Why do I wear abaya? Why do I make all five of my prayers? Why do I fast Ramadan? Why do I stay away from sex, drugs, rock and roll? Why? Because I want Allah's love so that the hellfire will never touch me. I want to be amongst those who will live forever in paradise, the place of true happiness, because there is no happiness here. Listen to what the prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. He said, Allah said. What kind of hadith is this? Can anyone tell me? The prophet said that Allah said. What kind of hadith is this? Anyone tell me. Kutsi. MashaAllah, Amina. This is a hadith kutsi. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that Allah said, I have prepared for my righteous worshipers such things that no eye has ever seen, no ear has ever heard of, and nobody has ever thought of. What is he speaking about? Paradise. That's why we believe in him. That's why we obey him. That's why we do what he commands, because this is what we're looking for. You're not going to find that in this world, sisters. You're not going to find this type of happiness, this type of bliss, this type of reality in this world. This is only in the hereafter. But also, as for the hellfire, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said the hellfire is the place for the wrongdoers. It's the place of punishment prepared for the unbelievers and the oppressors. It is the place of punishment for those who disbelieved in Allah and who disobeyed him and his prophets. It is a place filled with severe torments. Oh my God, you sisters can't handle the bad things that happen to us in this world. What makes you think you can handle the hellfire? So these two beautiful hadiths here alone are enough reason, enough reason for us to do what Allah says do. When Ramadan ends, you want to continue with the good deeds. You want to continue obeying your Lord. You want to continue fulfilling the obligations he's imposed upon us from prayer to hijab to everything else because you want the good ending. And as Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning, fear the hellfire which has been prepared for the unbelievers. This is why I tell you guys, this is why the prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the only thing that we should fear other than Allah is death. Because death puts to end all your chances. And death leads to this, the hellfire, which Allah has told us to fear. 
Allah tells us that the hellfire is already prepared. Oh yeah, it's in existence. It's burning right now. This is a reality. And just as hellfire is a reality, so is paradise. It's not something metaphorical. It's not some pleasing or tormented state of mind. It's these are two real entities that exist. We got some Muslims who believe that paradise and hell don't exist now. They don't, they believe that, that, that these two entities will not exist until the hereafter. They believe that you have a comfortable life with a good house and this is your paradise. And they believe that if your spouse is giving you a hard time, that's your hair. Okay, this is not true guys. Paradise and hell exist the souls we got souls in paradise right now as we speak the souls of the martyrs the souls of the prophets the souls of the believers and the children are in paradise right now as we speak and on the other hand the souls of the unbelievers the souls of the sinful muslims are in the hell fire right now as we speak so these things have been already prepared for us. They're already in existence. They're real. Also, to show how serious the hellfire is, the prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, hell will be brought forward on the day of judgment. It will have 70,000 ropes attached to it with 70,000 angels pulling on each rope. So that shows how large an entity the hellfire is. It's going to be dragged by the angels. And Allah says to have fear of him. Screen yourself and avoid the hellfire. Okay. So I want you Muslims to think about this because when Ramadan ends, a lot of you may go back to living the lives you were living before it. Some of you may even have intentions now to continue with that life. Well, think about these realities. Think about the destroyer of, pair of pleasure known as death. Think about the hereafter. And again, there are so many descriptions that Allah has given us of the hellfire. For example, listen to what Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning. Indeed, Allah has cursed the unbelievers and prepared for them a fire. Also, Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning and say the truth is from your Lord. So whoever wills, let him believe. And whoever wills, let him disbelieve. In other words, you questioning Allah now, we're going to find out the truth. The truth will be told. When that angel of death pulls your soul from your throat, you will know if you're going to paradise. You will know if you're going to hell. He's going to let you know. Oh, yeah. He's going to let you know. Also, Allah says in the interpretation, the meaning, indeed, we have prepared for the wrongdoers a fire whose walls will surround them. And if they call out for relief, they will be relieved with water that tastes like murky oil, which will scald their faces. Terrible is the drink and evil is their resting place. Subhanallah. Allah. So again, it's all about balance in Islam. Today, my six o'clock class, you know, I gave you guys all the hope. The hope. The hope that Allah will forgive us of our sins, which he will. If we are sincere in our repentance. If we are sincere in wanting to change the condition of ourselves. If we are sincere in wanting a great ending for ourselves. And to balance it out, we have to always keep in the back of our mind that for those of us who are not sincere, those of us who choose to disobey Allah, the ending 
may not be so great. All right. So I'm going to stop right here. Supana kalahuma wa bihamdika. Asharu anla ilaha ila anta. Astaghfiruka wa tubu ilayhi.